Brett, good morning. It's it's morning for you, right? How, how you doing? It is. It is. I'm doing great. Great to see you. No, great, great to see you in this weird virtual place that we've got going on right now. Um, well, look, Brett, thanks so much for joining us on Disrupt. I just want to jump straight into it. Uh, lots happened since the last time I saw you. Can you give us a bit of a, a brief overview around LinkedIn's re-entry? Um, what's that looking like right now? There's a lot of uncertainty. And, and then beyond that, what's, uh, what's work going to look like at, at LinkedIn into the future? Um, yeah, well, it's been a journey. And like you said, this has been a long 18 months for all of us. Um, it seems like every month it's something new and you take a couple steps forward and then you take a few steps back and we've all kind of realized and my team has realized that the only constant is change and we got to be okay with that. And, you know, um, so we have adopted a kind of, uh, mindset that says, we're going to do whatever we can do in any local jurisdiction. So the best we can do, whatever local conditions and local government guidance allows, that's what we're going to do. So in some places, that's pretty good right now. In China, it feels almost normal. In other places, uh, we have offices that aren't even open yet. So uh, and they run the gamut. And the experience we're trying to give is the best experience we can safely give everybody right now. But we're also thinking about where do we go from here? What is it that people are going to want? And we know that just a desk is not why people want to come back to the office. So we're really thinking about what are the next set of experiences that we need to bring to a workplace experience? They're going to get people out of bed in the morning and get them to come to the office. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about that, you know, in, in this world where the only constant is change. And, you know, certainly before all this happened, you there was it was possible to have quite a flexible arrangement at LinkedIn going into the office. And, and now mm -hmm. that's going to be even more so. Um, so I guess, you know, you're one of these people that I know thinks that having a physical space to go to at least every now and then is still vital. So in your mind, why why is a physical place still important? In, in the future? Yeah, well, for the, a lot of reasons uh, that you mentioned earlier, um, human beings are social creatures. And, you know, we're, we're all on the spectrum of uh, extroversion, introversion. But most of us want to be around other people a decent amount of the time. And you look at how we build relationships with the people in your life. A lot of that has to do with social gathering and connectivity, um, building connections, um, building relationships. You can do all that virtually. And certainly people could have long distance relationships, for instance, and rarely see one another. But it's not nearly the same as seeing each other on a daily basis. It's just not the same experience. And so being in person, is that opportunity to to really rebuild and strengthen those connections or make connections the first time we have a whole bunch of employees a lot of people who we've hired since the pandemic who've never even met one another never been to an office and never met their coworkers. and i think um, their level of connectivity and the relationships they build is very different from those people who have known each other from years who have gone on trips together who have uh, been to events together and you know and, and in those things you go through the hard times you go through the good the the good times you you're always building and strengthening your bonds with other people so um being at a place together in person to me is really important because it's a completely different thing than i mean it's like sports going to a game in person is completely different than watching it on television or or listening to it on the radio it just doesn't compare and there's a reason you go to it there's a reason you go to uh to see a musical or play in person it is a different experience. And while there are lots of options for how you can work at home and get work done and be productive, you it is very difficult to have those sorts of experiences that make you, uh, that kind of fill your spirit and make you feel alive and make you feel connected than is when you come together in person. You know, It just doesn't happen in a remote setting. Yeah, and I, I, wanna, I wanna focus on that a bit more just the what the physical space is going to have to turn into i just want to put a reminder out there for anyone tuning in please throw up any questions here and i'll see if i can ask them towards the end uh but you know there's this line that you uh say i've heard you say a few times brett and it's like you know you guys have got to be building experiences or places that are worth getting out of bed for so you know workplace is still so important so i guess how are you thinking about how space needs to change then what's going to make these 
places, these spaces more appealing for people to go to and yeah, want to get out of bed for. Yeah. And, I, and I'm actually taking it beyond getting out of bed. I think it's putting on pants for, um, you know, you don't <laughs> ever know who's wearing pants these days on their calls. And I think, you know, how do we create, what are the experiences that would make the things you would normally have come to the office for more meaningful? So take, for instance, I, how I don't, I'm guessing everybody on this call right now um, would say that sitting in a conference room for an hour with eight of their closest workmates is not the ideal way to spend an hour. And then if you do that seven, eight times in a day, it's not an ideal way to spend your day, nor is sitting at a desk while trying to get heads down work done with people on either side of you talking across you or over you or someone who was a loud talker making a lot of noise. None of those were ideal circumstances and it didn't really work that well before. How do we, but when people come together and they're trying to, to do something as a group, if they're trying to collaborate on a, you know, come up with a creative solution to a problem. And that may mean using whiteboards and being in the same space and just kind of uh, vibing off of uh, each other and the energy in the room. Um, it could be, that you want to come in and you want to build relationships as a team. You want to, you know, strengthen your connection because you're feeling like, you know, we, yes, we're getting a lot of work done, but there's just not a lot of energy. There's just not a lot of connectivity. People aren't trusting each other the way they used to. So maybe you come in and instead of having that meeting in a conference room, you have some sort of activity around it. Maybe you have, you know, there's a crazy one I've been throwing out, but what if you build golf simulators and they, you turn them into meeting rooms and you have, you know, uh, digital displays and whiteboards, but you also can have food and snacks there throughout the day. And you turn what could have been a really kind of dull four hour session into a really fun, engaging session. We actually got some work done at the same time. So I think it's instead of trying to separate, you know, it was always like, okay, you're trying to get as much work done as possible. You're trying to get, be really focused when you're in the office. And then we companies like us would have game rooms or we'd have these other things, which were always intended to be kind of like, a break in your day or some sort of distraction. Instead, let's embrace the idea that when you're doing these sorts of activities and you're around and, and comfortable and relaxed, you're your true self and you're going to bring better ideas to the same problem into the conversation um, than when you're disconnected or separate or maybe video turned off and actually not even paying attention or, you know, worse yet, you're actually talking to somebody about something else while you're on that virtual call and I, you can't tell because I can't tell what your hands are doing and you know or if you're wearing pants and and you know but the idea that you're there together you're engaged you're looking at each other you understand how people actually feel about something I think again this doesn't have to happen every day I'm not there's no need and, and sometimes when special things happen every day they're no longer special but then when you do do them they're fantastic and you walk away going man I want to do that again soon because it was really rewarding yeah, a few things you brought up there, the, the chief one being pantsless people in, in virtual meetings. And thanks, Brett. I'm probably never going to look at my workmates the same again <laughs> in a virtual call. But uh, how disconcerting. But that's a less than optimal situation. And you, you brought something else up there too, which is a less than optimal situation in the physical workplaces. You know, people, teams booking out a conference room for a day, staying in the same glass enclosure and, and creating these kind of silos that, it doesn't really lead to much connection and cohesion across uh, teams and, and the company. So do you think that's something that could potentially pop up if workplaces don't change? And how do we get around it? Do you have other things that you're testing or other initiatives yeah. that you hope to put into place once you open up again? Certainly, because, and, and again, conference rooms were never, you know, the, the idea of a conference table comes from, you know, from dinner tables and from, you know, uh, kind of the royal court and the head of the table and who's in charge. And then boardroom tables are the same way. They're set up so that someone is at the head of the table and everyone else is subservient to them. Um, so rectangular conference tables really aren't great for people in the room. They're not great for people calling in. And, and frankly, in a post-COVID kind of reality, no one really wants to be in a hermetically sealed box for a long time with a bunch of other people, especially if someone has the sniffles. And, and so how do we change that paradigm? And so we're looking at totally different configurations of conference room space, different furniture, new technology, more cameras, interactive whiteboards, um, just changing the posture and the direction that people are facing in the room um, will have a big impact on bringing everybody to an even playing field. We're looking at a couple different technologies with some of our partners to try and make it so that everybody, whether you're in the room or whether you're at home, 
feels like they're equal in that conversation. And that's a really tough one because if anybody has done these meetings now, these hybrid meetings, I'm looking at my screen because I'm talking to you at home and I have people sitting on either side of me and I'm not looking at them or I'm looking at them and then you feel odd because I'm not looking at you. So there are folks trying to solve for that. They're trying to figure out how to make it so that eye contact is a big part of this and making it feel natural. So how do we have meetings that are great for the people in the room, connect the people outside the room and we get away from what used to happen, which was, oh, well, you called in. That means you didn't make the effort to show up. That means I'm not going to make the effort to connect you to the meeting. You can't hear what's being said. I'm not going to repeat it. And I may have an under my breath sort of conversation with the person next to me that you're definitely not going to hear. Or worse yet, I'll decide to wait until after the meeting to have that conversation so I don't include you. And I think so we can do all we can with the room configuration, with the technology, with the furniture. We also have to teach and train people to train, change their behavior. And they have to believe, and I think they will, once you can empathize and you're that person who's been at home many times or remote or in some of the location when someone's on the call, you then act differently and have empathy for the people who aren't in the room. You make sure they hear everything that's being said. You make sure they can see what's being done in the room so that they are connected. And if they're not, you stop that meeting and you make you bring them in. But that's something we have to train people. We have to change you know, long held beliefs and behaviors and paradigms to make sure that just becomes second nature to all of us. Otherwise, hybrid really won't work because it'll start to again favor the in-office uh, people. Yeah, some some really good points there, Brett. And, uh, you know, in inclusion from the standpoint of, you know, everyone having access, equal access to what's happening in a meeting or what's happening within their teams is going to be really key. And that's going to be an adjustment period. But it, it brings me to a, an audience question we just have uh, had come through from Antonia Cardone from Cushman and Wakefield, who was also at our first event. Hi, Antonia. Uh, and she asks, in, you know, in relation to that, what new technologies support those types of engaging interactions? And, and I guess in your mind, where does the technology technology need to go to really uh, enable for what you were just talking about? Yeah, so um, the interactive whiteboards is a start, and we're trying a few different versions, a few different hardware solutions and some software solutions around that. There's also um, uh, whiteboard capture technology. It lets you use traditional marker boards, and it captures whatever you're writing, so anybody that's not in the room can see what you're writing uh, at real time. It doesn't allow for two-way engagement. Um, some of these interactive technologies I've seen are not that great from a uh, UI perspective. So, like as I'm writing, the writing isn't smooth or there's lag, um, which discourages people from using it. So, I, but I think this technology is going to come along really quickly. Um, the cameras and the control of cameras by end users outside of the, the physical space is super important so that you can decide to look where you want to look. And, and just like you could in the room, you could turn your head and, and see whatever part of the room you want. We need to make it so that you can control, have some control when you're not in the room. Um, audio is huge and having really good audio that doesn't pick up a ton of background noise and make it hard to hear what's being said, but just picks up the person who's t speaking is also really important. And so we're trying a bunch of different uh, microphone technologies in ceiling technologies. We've gone away from uh, any microphones mounted on the works on a surface, on a table or any horizontal surface because it picks up too much ambient noise. So those are a few of them. The other thing is putting some of this out in the open workspace so that people don't feel compelled to go into a conference room. So we've got a couple locations where we're testing these same config setups out in workspace or on mobile carts so that if you're just having a conversation with the person sitting next to you, you could just as easily um, pull them over, pull the mobile card over and have, you know, one or two people dial in from somewhere else, be part of that conversation. And then it's as natural as it's going to be in a hybrid sort of environment right now. I can tell you that I personally don't have any belief that the kind of virtual going to avatars and creating a virtual environment is any better. What's I actually think it's worse because you really can hide behind all that and really have no idea what you're doing individually. I just know what your avatar is doing. So for me, it's really about how you bring the qualities and the characteristics of an in-person experience to the remote attendee so they feel connected to the conversation and they don't feel like an outsider. I'm not a fan of the metaverse potential there. <laughs> <laughs> Having a little avatar. Not my, I gotta say not my thing. Right. I got to say, there's nothing more disconcerting in a virtual meeting, apart from the notion of someone being pantsless, of course, that this happens like that. So 
good to see you've got some yeah. uh, you know, working, doing some tests on the technology there. And um, we got, which is related to that, another audience question, Brett, um, from Brendan O'Neill at Robin. Um, with all these sort of measures you're putting in place or these initiatives, I I'm wondering personally, you know, like, you know, how do you know that workers are really going to care about it? How, how do you know they're going to really uh, want to be these things that you're testing out and trying out are actually going to appeal to them? And, and Brendan asks, you know, how are you, how are you measuring success for office spaces through 2021? And, uh, or is 2022 going to be the year that you're going to measure all of that? Yeah, I think it would be hard to get any meaningful measurements until we really have people back in numbers. Um, and I think while there are still mask mandates, you, people aren't going to come back to the office in, in numbers. Um, it doesn't really matter what we do. And I, I don't think it's realistic to believe that you would come back. I'm actually I'm working from my home office because we have a mask mandate in Santa Clara County. And it's hard to for me to connect with the number of people I need to connect with when I have to have a mask on for those conversations. Um, so I think 2022 is when we'll start to get that data. And for us, it's a combination of a few different things. Um, we do have sensors installed in a lot of our spaces that'll help us gather information just on activity, on are there bodies in the space? And if they are, where are they at? Um, we use Wi-Fi triangulation and badging data. So we, we mix all that together with also um, kind of uh, observational data, looking, being in the space. Uh, we have workplace ambassadors and part of their job is to really help people understand what is available to them and what the space is there to do for them. But they also are observing and watching and learning and seeing what's working and what's not. So kind of collecting that data along with uh, ongoing set of surveys that we do, um, recurring surveys, focus groups, we're going to continue to just ask as many questions to get as much data as we can to try and really understand and but it's it all has to be pieced together and i think it's going to be what i've been saying is once once you get a significant part of the population and i i would say that's 25 percent maybe of your where you think your end state is once you get to that amount i think you need about six months of data before you can really draw any conclusions and our whole mindset as a company is iterate and learn together we're going to just keep iterating and trying things we're not trying to figure this out overnight and we know we can't we think the next couple of years are going to be about testing, experimenting, iterating, learning, and continuing to try new things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's definitely early days, Brett. And uh, I, I guess this is a, um, what I'm also thinking about, and, and maybe it's too early as well, but I guess how are you thinking about the parameters of success? Like what are the new measures of success moving forward? It's not just about productivity anymore, given how everyone's changing the way that they work, but there's also, other things to consider, like you know, uh, health and safety, health and wellness at, at, at work, and how are you? Do you have any ideas or thoughts around yeah. what these metrics are moving forward, both quantitative and qualitative, and and how the hell are you going to figure that out? <laughs> it's not going to be easy, and there's a long road ahead to to figure this out. Um, part of what I want to get to is where we're not just having conversations about utilization I, you know, is something used or not? Yes. That's a valuable insight. Um, but I really want to know, is it bringing the value that we want it to bring? So I guess a couple of ways we're thinking about is both employee engagement and business engagement. And by business engagement, I mean, with the business organizations themselves, what are the things they're trying to accomplish as a team? And how can we help them accomplish them? And different leaders and different teams are going to have different opinions on what that means and what they need. But we want to help them start to solve those problems. It's a very different place than where we've all been for the last you know, two decades in this conversation, which is I need space. I need this much. And I need it by this date. And we would basically do that. And if we needed new services, we provide new services. What I want to get into is a conversation where we're collectively in, in a coordinated fashion trying to understand the needs of the business and then figure out what can we do from a workplace experience perspective, whether it be at home or in the office, what can we do to support those goals? So I think it's going to be different by business unit. It's going to be different by in, in, in and I think it's going to be the type of thing that whether it's a monthly cadence or quarterly cadence, I want to have those conversations regularly, looking back at how we performed, looking forward at what the goals are, and always thinking about how can we do better. And I also think that the solutions are going to become highly individualized by site and maybe even by team based on how those teams work. And the team that has a leader with a cadence of seeing each other in person once a quarter is very different than a team that has a cadence of meeting weekly. 
and their needs are going to be different. So it'll be tough. I don't know specifically what the metrics are beyond, you know, just straight utilization of different things, but I think it has to be tied to the effectiveness of that utilization. So yes, okay, this I had a goal for this thing, this space to be used 80% of the time, it was. Now I look at that 80%, was that effective use of the space? Was it used in the way it was intended or was it used some other way? And then it continued to change and evolve. So I think it's just, it's more about a, a constant kind of evolution that we're going to be on as we go through this. And I don't know that that will ever stop. I think we're going to keep learning and then we'll keep evolving. Definitely a lot of moving parts on moving parts and moving parts. It seems to get bigger and bigger, you know, as we go along, Brett, but um, thanks for, uh, you haven't got the solution yet, but thanks for taking a, it's really insightful. Um, and I know we're just, we're nearly out of time, Brett, but uh, we have one more question. I think you might be able to answer very quickly before we wrap up here from the audience, uh, Lance Duke from CRE Advisors. Uh, and he says, you know, perhaps Microsoft Outlook will allow you to accept a meeting with an indication whether you will be in person or online, um, which I guess brings up, you know, that being said, have you seen any of your landlords begin to introduce technology to help control building occupancy? Um, I, I'm sure some of our landlords are working on those strategies. We typically use our own strategy and we are actually working on tools internally um, Microsoft, you know, our parent company is working on solutions for around Outlook, around Teams to do exactly what, what you just asked. And so we'll, we're going to continue to see new technology that comes around that. Um, we're hopeful that we're going to have a tool internally that will help you manage your day and your week based on where your team is. Um, and really just to, it's around your intention and it's not, well, I have to be here then, but this is where I intend to be, which days of the week. So that other people can start to plan because otherwise in, in, in lieu of that, it's a whole bunch of time spent looking at calendars and, and which people don't want to be controlled. They don't want to be constrained to that. They want to have the freedom to make real time decisions about where they are and how they work. So I think having a tool like that, that becomes really intuitive, that has a mobile component is going to be really important. Um, again, we're exploring all the technologies that are out there. We're trying to develop our own. And you know, I think there's a lot of them are going to come to market in the very near future. So I, I think there'll be a lot of options for all of us. Perfect. Thanks, Brett. And thanks, Lance, for that uh, question there. And uh, I know you just got to go, Brett, and uh, we don't want to take your, too much of your time any longer. But just lastly, is there anything that kind of pisses you off uh, within the sort of uh, corporate real estate community, any line of thinking either right now or in general that you just like, that completely misses the mark or, uh, or is, is there well, something I think that kind of gives you, peeves you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the belief that you have to be, you have to make people come to the office to somehow can, you know, I, I can't think of what else it's about other than wanting to control and see what they're doing and watch what they're doing. You got to trust your people and you got to you got to know that they're going to do what's right. And I think that's a big part of our mantra as a company and our culture is we have to trust one another. And um, that watching those companies, and there's not a lot of them, but watching the ones who are taking a really firm stance on this and you will be back and this is how you're going to work. And it's a condition of your employment to be back in the office. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be enough other companies that don't do that. And I don't know how long you're going to be able to stand toe the line on that, because I think they'll just see people leave in, in droves. And so I think the reality is we just have to create the best experience we possibly can and know that people are going to use it when they want to use it and not be worried about how often that happens. It, it will be what it is going to be. And over time, if that means you have a different real estate footprint or a smaller real estate footprint, then that's what's right for the business. But I think we as an industry, and I've seen a few design firms already try and have this kind of belief that they're going to make their people come to the office because they want to show their clients that they should be in the office. Like, this is how we work. So therefore, we're going to tell you the same out of fear of not having workplace based, you know, work anymore. There's going to be plenty of work to do around the workplace. The physical workplace in some iteration, shape or form is not going away. People are going to continue to be social animals. We shouldn't be trying to force them to do it in the way that we want. We should let them do what makes sense for them and we should be supportive of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting point you bring up. And I, I saw a quote on Twitter the other day about, you know, companies that insist on that hard line, you gotta be in the office, are kind of creating a, a cultural debt uh, moving forward, which mm -hmm. I thought was super interesting. Um, but hey, Brett, it, yeah. our time is up. I don't wanna keep you any longer. Uh, thanks so much for being on our first episode of Disrupt. You're going to be actually speaking at Workspaces um, this fall. We're really excited to have you back again. We've got a question for you. Do you have any uh, 
any requests for music any for our artists last time we had gavin rossdale from uh, bush along uh mm. got any requests? i'm thinking do you think you could do i mean i am a big foo fighters fan do you think you could pull that off jason i mean i, I really like that I, I don't know why i i don't even know why i asked you it it's, just, <laughs> it's probably too difficult for us to do i mean maybe we'll look into it brett i'm sorry i, I can't promise anything but um, no, look, we're, we're really excited to have you uh, at Workspaces thank you. come November. And look, thanks so much for joining us here on um, Office Hours today. Thank you. I loved it. Thanks for having me. No worries. Thanks so much. Well, guys, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks, Brett, for joining us. Like I just mentioned, uh, I'm going to give you a, a bit of a plug now uh, in your face uh, about our event coming back this, uh, this, this fall. November 14th to 16th, Workspaces is returning in person uh it's been a while since we've done this 2019 was the last time so we're super excited uh to to have you back uh in person in palm springs uh, we're going to put a link up here on the right hand side in the chat head there you can see our developing lineup our programs coming together really nicely uh and you can at that link request an invite and hopefully we'll see you in person at palm springs however we are getting the conversation started before we do that uh, we are holding our mastermind roundtables ahead of time, uh, end of this month and into early next month, just to get the conversation going. These are virtual roundtables uh, where you come together with a small group of your peers uh, to discuss a topic that is top of mind to you. Um, and those are limited in space. So make sure you head to the link. We're going to put that up there as well. If you want to sign up for any of those, no more than 10, 10 people in a session there. And it's a great way to get talking before we come together in Palm Springs this November. And hey, I hope you enjoyed this. If you don't already, follow our LinkedIn page so that you can see who our future guests are on Office Hours, as well as any updates we have coming up for our uh, live and virtual events. And uh, hey, can't wait to see you again into the future. So see you later.